Now I can tell you in the time that it will take me to get from the back of the room to the front of the podium, you will have already formed a number of opinions about me. First off, some of you are looking at my tie and wondering, good Lord, where did he get that? <laughs> all right? Some of you are saying, all right, typical keynote speaker in a dark suit. If I were to tell you that I actually work in Washington, D.C., your perception of me will change as well. In fact, there's a pretty cool bumper sticker that we see in Washington. Um, since I spent so much time on the Hill with the Senate offices and the congressional offices, you might call me a lobbyist. However, we've got a bumper sticker that says, I don't want to tell my mom I'm a lobbyist. I tell her I play a piano in a bordello. <laughs> so you also can probably tell, based on your experience, and for any of you who have read Malcolm Gladwell's Blink, that there are little differences in the way this presentation as a keynote address is going to be from other lectures. I sat in yesterday for a few minutes on the new drug presentation. And it was great, but it was traditional. And most of us had a preconceived notion about how presentations are done, just as we have preconceived notions about the people that we meet, the patients that we treat, and the folks literally sitting next to you and in front of you. So what I want to talk to you about today is perception and how perceptions not only externally but internally affect us as practitioners and our success in being able to advocate for pharmacy. All right, Mary made me do this. Dr. Jim, you messed up my system here. Mary made me do this. I had to have learning objectives written up. objective so we get CE, right? You get an hour and a half's worth of continuing education credit for this. Is that exciting? Yes, right? Yeah. One and a half. The problem is, I just checked my watch. I have to do it 90 minutes in what appears to be 65 minutes because we're going to get out of here exactly in time for the next presentation, which is, by the way, going to be about the NECC crisis. I am from the East Coast. You guys are Midwesterners. I talk super, super fast. You should see the presentations I do in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. Those are the learning objectives. Mary, you're going to get really upset when you see the next slide. This is what we're really going to be talking about. Okay, because I can't stand it. As a pharmacist, I go to CE programs. Gosh, you got to give me. And I want to take something home. I'm not sitting here just for the credit. I came to take something home of value. So what's in it for me? And I want to leave you with some tidbits, some things that you can take back to your practice setting. Heck, some of the stuff you can try on your family. Um, gentlemen, how many of you in this room are trying to negotiate the purchase of a larger screen television? <laughs> Seriously, show of hands, okay? Some of what we talk about may be successful in getting you the bigger screen, all right? Some of it may help. This is what I need to ask you to do. All right, I promise I will have you out of here exactly on time. I will give you something in return. But what I need you to do is to actually be engaged. And it's really tough for us because right now I've got a laptop. I've got a timer running this presentation on my tablet up there. I've got a cell phone in my pocket. Every single one of us are constantly engaged. And I know, because I was standing in the back of the room, some of you are already texting. Wow, this is a great presentation. <laughs> some of you have been posting on Facebook already. Hey, in meeting room at uh, Renson in Denver, listening to MPA convention with a selfie that you have just taken. Do me a favor. Please just turn off for a little bit. Now, I understand if you are on call. That's the one exception. If you're on call and somebody needs your assistance and you're here, but there's a patient someplace that depends upon you, I understand that. But now is not the time to be surfing eBay. <laughs> because the person sitting next to you has greater value than the virtual relationship that you're engaging on with your electronics. 
So I ask you just for a little bit, turn off, because you may not get an opportunity to meet the person next to you or behind you or at lunch or at the exhibit hall ever again. And that personal connection for us as pharmacists is incredibly valuable. There's also another reason. Please stand up, Ms. Carrie. Ms. Carrie, Kim is in charge of the MPA Foundation. And if your phone rings during this presentation, if you deem, chirp, or whir, and I'm assuming you don't have Tourette's, you will be fined 50 bucks. So whoever gets it, it's $50. Cash, we take credit cards, we also take checks. We do not take the small born, first born. And it goes to the scholarship club. She's my enforcer. You want to show them the ugly face? <laughs> so if I hear terms and words, it's 50 bucks to the foundation. Is that reasonable? Sometimes we have to punish. Now the theme for today's program, I think I don't know and not me, is I was talking to Larry because he said, you know, we'd really like to have you come in and talk a little bit about what's going on with compounding. And I was like, oh God, not compounding again, all right? Because for the past year, we have all, in pharmacy, watched a major elementary component of our profession being drugged through the mud because of the behaviors of not only one of our colleagues and colleagues, in Massachusetts, but also the failure of our regulatory system. And we're going to be talking in the next session about what constitutes the perfect storm that we experienced in 2012 and 2013 as it relates to compounding. But what's intriguing is how frequently, how frequently I talk with folks around the country who said, well, that would never happen here in Michigan. And it would never happen in Tennessee. And it would never happen in Pennsylvania because my board of pharmacy wouldn't do that. And we don't have people like that who practice. When in reality, that tragedy pointed out deficiencies throughout our system. So I use this theme. Most of you are familiar with the family circus. And in the mid-1970s, Bill Keene, who was the illustrator, he since passed away, created a couple little ghosts or gremlins. One was I don't know and one was not me. You're going to see them pop up throughout our discussions today, and I'm going to ask you and challenge you, are you responding that way internally? So let's talk about perceptions. I said, as I was walking up through this aisleway, you have already, based on micro expressions, your assessment of your past, what you have seen, what you have experienced in other programs, people that you have met, people that wear wild, crazy ties, that there is something different. And you've made a judgment. I'm not going to ask you what it was. Now, I almost wore this, which is usually my DC uniform. It's a bow tie. But, and I saw somebody's got one on. There you are. Yes, excellent. <laughs> if I had worn a bow tie, your impression of me would have been differently. And in fact, when I had to do uh, go through media training for interviews, on NBC television and all kinds of other stuff that I had to go through last year, um, I actually was told how to dress because specific ways of dressing convey a specific response in other people. There's an entire psychology associated with perceptions. Let's play with this a little bit. One of our biggest problems when it comes to perceptions is that oftentimes we have a breakdown between what we say and what we actually mean. How many of you have children? How many of you have experienced a communication slash perception problem based on what you said and what they, what you really meant? Don't do that. Very clear. Is that really what you meant? If you do that, I'm going to beat the daylights out of you. That's often unsaid. Some examples.
and one more. <laughs> all right, we all know what we're looking at. But I have a question for you. You reacted in a very specific way to what was on the screen. First and foremost, they're just words on the screen. By the way, they are all real headlines from articles and newspapers. You knew exactly what was meant, but you also saw it in a completely different way. There's a problem, though. Not all of you laughed. Not all of you laughed. Some of you laughed harder at certain things than others did. Right? Did the person beside you not laugh when you laughed? Of course they did. There were instances where that happened. Here's something else. Did you find people that laughed really loudly around you? Were there any loud laughers? It's OK. Point them out. <laughs> now see, you're laughing again. No, serious. Point them out. We're just laughing loud. Anyone? You all are from Michigan. You all are nice and polite here. <laughs> see, the thing is that oftentimes, people find that to be annoying. And your perception of somebody that has a loud laugh can actually be quite negative. Isn't that strange? Your laughter itself is a perception-induced behavior based on the following. One, the people around you are acting in a certain way. Therefore, I should be acting in a similar manner. I am in a large group. I am participating, and I have to have a certain set of behaviors. And it is polite to pay attention to the speaker. Most of you are staring at me. Why? I don't know. Because I happen to be in the middle of the room. But we have been socialized to do this. How many of you are familiar with the process of socialization? It's something we have all gone through. Socialization is the way that we as individuals, starting very small, are brought into patterns of behavior based upon certain situations and expectations. Give me an example of when, how you were socialized. And by the way, if you don't raise your hand or look enthusiastic, I will come and pick on you. Generally, I have found it's the people that lower their heads that I go to first. And I also tend to go to the people in the back because they think, no way is anyone going to come all the way from the podium all the way to the back of the room. Example of how you were socialized. Yes, you. Oh, look at this. I have a microphone, too. Yes, give me an example of how you were socialized to interact with the large group, or a small group, or a group of other Excellent. OK, great. I'm sorry. Christy, Christy said, when I went to school, even as a kindergartner, I was told to, what, be quiet? and pay attention to the teacher. Sound right? That's a socialization process. Were there any of you not quiet in class? <laughs> Were some of you ever made to stand in the corner of the room because you couldn't shut up? <laughs> That's an example of socialization. Excellent. What about Sunday school, church? What's your behavior in church? Quiet. Don't be loud. Funerals. Socialization process. Somber. Serious. But it varies depending on where you are in the country. Your behavior in church varies on, upon the denomination. So depending on your family and how you were raised, your perception of behavior may actually be different from the person sitting next to you, even though they kind of look like you. That's important because, as I said before, it's not just what we say and what we mean. It's what someone else hears, sees, and believes. Why is this critical? As I just mentioned, and Christine was talking about her socialization, in as a little kid, what's kindergarten age? Four or five? Mm -hmm. And now in preschool, we we're shipping them out even earlier. So they are learning these habits and behaviors. They're taking them in. Our subconsciousness always is working, however, because everything that we take in, everything that we see, we hear, we register, you're looking at me, you're looking at 
the screen, you're listening and hearing the person sitting next to you is all being sent through a massive set of very fuzzy filters. Now, the precise pharmacists in the room are looking at this slide and saying, I really can't read that. There's a shadow behind it. You know, if I did this PowerPoint presentation, I would go back and change the font color of that and, and make it much more crisp. How many of you thought that in your head? Please raise your hand. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Would you ever believe that there is a reason why they're fuzzy to begin with? They're intentionally fuzzy. Why? Because the stuff that we have in our subconscious is fuzzy. Our memories that we think are absolutely 100% correct are not. Our beliefs can be changed as well over time. Certainly our behaviors and our attitudes towards groups, and we see that right now socially with major changes in perception related to same-sex marriage. And I think if you have read or seen anything that has been happening in the news across the country is we as a society have done almost a 180 on a very controversial issue. We are in the process of rewriting parts of our subconsciousness depending on what we are exposed to and how we think about it. Now, the reason why it's fuzzy is because it changes. And for those of you who believe that you have 100% perfect memory, especially the guys in the room, how many of us have heard our wives say, that's not what I said? And just to clarify, when you get the look, similar to the one that Carrie gave you, by the way, which she usually reserves for her husband, and so far we're not making any money. We should have 500 bucks by now. <laughs> you know very well that when you get the sentence that says, well, you know, you know what you did. Or not even that, right? So behaviors, attitudes, all of this stuff is churning in our subconsciousness and it affects our perception of the people around us and situations and how does that play out? Now the next big question is, you've got all this stuff surrounding you, and for those of you in management who have a traditional org chart where, my guess is that MPA, the staff, have seen an org chart where Larry is at the top, and then there's people in the middle, and then there's all the folks that actually do the work at the bottom. <laughs> right? That's the typical org chart in most hospital pharmacies, health systems pharmacies, community pharmacies, managed care pharmacies, corporations, you name it. In reality, we are the center of the universe. Each one of us is the center of our universe. And everything that we take in is bounced off of those building blocks, those fuzzy building blocks I just showed you. The next question, though, is if you've got perceptions, regardless of what they happen to be, how do you change them? And are there times when you want them to be changed? And in actuality, our perceptions are extremely fragile. You can flip them back and forth all the time. Now the trick is knowing how to do that. So let's try it. What do you see? Skeleton. How do you see a skull? Hands up. How many of you see a lady with a mirror, looking in a mirror? How many of you see both? How many of you are sitting there saying, I saw the skull, oh, there's the lady in the mirror. Okay, how many of you saw the lady in the mirror and said, oh, there's the skull. All right, right now, your brain, which you generally rely on to give you specific information, is fighting with itself to transmit and decipher a pattern presenting to you, even though you don't know it, a level of uncomfortableness in your subconscious as it tries to decide which one is the right one. So which one is the right one? You're the right one. Depends on your perspective or your perception. Now this is an easy one. Let's try another one. What do you see? What do you see? See a circus? 
ears. What do you see now? What do you see now? Clown. <laughs> okay, you see both at the same time. Your eye is constantly switching back and forth. Your brain is constantly, right now, changing the perception of what you first thought was a clown to a circus. Now, some of you are already sitting there saying, I don't see the circus. Well, we've got a tent. We've got a man on a unicycle with a hoop. We've got a what appears to be a dog or a seal on his back of a ball. And it's not very good, but there are little elephants up in the corner, upper right-hand corner, and there are Ladies standing on horseback that are jumping over hurdles that form basically the neck of the clown. Your brain is registering all of these, and you are still flipping back and forth trying to establish with which pattern it is. Um, this is a lot easier. What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? What do you see? That's the first one. So in just a few split seconds, just like Gladwell writes about in his book Blink, which I do recommend you pick up if you have not read, you constantly are registering information. And once you have taken it in, you can't untake it. So if I change your perspective, your perception, of something, you can't change it back. Because your brain will constantly be remembering this piece of information and this piece of information at the same time. So that's the beauty of altering someone's perception. Do me a favor, because y'all have been really well behaved and you've been sitting for 40 minutes. And I know something about us pharmacists, we don't sit at work, usually. So do me a favor, stand up for this next exercise. That does not give you an excuse to text behind my back. <laughs> Little stretching, that's good. Little run for room stuff, that's good. Now this is what I want you to do. Do not yell it out. Do not say, oh, it's A. I'm going to show you an image. And when you know what it is, sit down. But don't say anything. Ready? sitting down. That's a good sign.
Okay, how many of you still standing up still don't see it? Stay standing up. <clears throat> if you're sitting next to someone that sees it, ask them, am I blind? <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs>
and uh, the tar and their plucking chickens. <laughs> so let's take a look at some of the perceptions that we have about ourselves. Are you prejudiced about your practice setting? Do you think that your practice setting is far superior to somebody else's practice setting? And I see some of you going, oh no, no. <laughs> I am a 100% all-inclusive practice setting bar. So, let me put it to you this way. You don't have to answer. You can look me in the eye, and that's all right. I won't give you away, Terry. <laughs> what do you think of pharmacists that work at Walmart or Costco? How about community pharmacists? What do you think of the hospital pharmacists? They're in the basement. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed that one. <laughs> they're not in the basement? No. No, they're not. Okay. They're up on the attic floor. Okay. <laughs> so we have prejudices already built in amongst us about different practice settings, and I guarantee you that that is the case. The independents who are sitting there saying there is no Walgreens pharmacist alive, they could be half as good as I am in taking care of my patients. We have built-in prejudices and perceptions about each other. So, one of the problems that we have is within pharmacy, and the reason why you're at the NBA annual convention this year is to help move the profession forward. We've got a lot of stuff that's changing within pharmacy. We mentioned the NECC compounding situation. That was a massive examination of a fundamental aspect of what we do as professionals. And it is going to change as we re-regulate and examine it from a quality standpoint. We have massive uncertainties about our jobs. How many of you have seen salaries decrease? Decrease with a D. How many pharmacy students did not have jobs when they graduated? or it took them some time to find a job. Our hospitals are struggling to find funding for residencies. What are we doing with tax? Who's responsible for technicians? And there's a lot of questions also about what is the public's perception of us as pharmacists? Now, you know, those damn nurses, I hate those nurses. <laughs> Because we were number one in the Gallup poll for 15 years, and then they let the nurses in. And we went to number two. Except for one year, we were actually number three because of the firemen, and that was in, two, in uh, 2001 because of 9-11. But we've always been the most trusted professional number two. But what exactly is the public's perception of what we do? We also know that as we are being pushed into the concept of collaborative practice, team care, that there are some gender resistances being pushed back on pharmacists and us going and saying, hey, my gosh, we're the best at doing medication therapy management. Dr. Dave, let me help you. And what does Dr. Dave say? <laughs> oh, that was really polite. Okay, I can't, I can't repeat that out loud. But... <laughs> And I have heard that coming out of Dr. Smith. I, I don't need your help. I don't need your help. I've got this under control. Um, and then this last sentence, which actually came from a, a, a great interview of a pharmacist saying that, you know, I'm worried about my future in the profession because the bottom is falling out of the middle. Now, the bottom of the fall is falling out of the middle. What does that mean? We are actually seeing a loss of our pharmacists into other positions, into other professions, into other business activities. Because what we started out with, that enthusiasm that we have as young pharmacists and as students like Teresa up here in the front, she's sitting in the front row. And she's not getting a grade for this. <laughs> in CE classes, you get to sit in the back so you can wander in and out if you want to. You don't have to be in the front row. <laughs> Who's participating in adopt a student? Okay? Who's got an adopt? Someone adopt her and show her how it's supposed to be done. All right? But are you excited about being a pharmacist? 
Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, as you get kind of old like Larry and I, we're still excited about being pharmacists because we can see the end coming. Yay! But we are, and look around you. Look around you. See many people in their 30s in this room? Some of you. But we are either end of the spectrum. We are experiencing a falling out of the middle, not because those folks aren't engaged, but we are actually seeing some attrition as they move out of the profession of pharmacy. Why? Why are we losing them? Because what they were promised is not what they received. And some of us got through that and others could not. So, next, let's talk about some more interviews of us. Those of this is not the pretty part. Pharmacists are too risk averse that we are passive aggressive. My personal favorite, and I've heard this many times, you know what, I don't want to do MTM because I might screw it up and I might make a mistake. And fundamentally, the reason why we're not changing is because of us. Not necessarily because Dr. Dave up here says he doesn't want my help as a physician, but really how many and how often do you see pharmacists going out <coughs> and saying, Doc, I'd like to work with you and your patients with diabetes, cholesterol, whatever it happens to be. That's not in our general nature. There have been an increasing number of studies. Dr. Zubin Austin, who is with the University of Toronto, has actually focused a lot of his work on examining us, putting us on the couch and finding out what it is about pharmacists and what's inside of us and our perceptions of ourselves and the way that we look at the world that's actually probably responsible for our professions not being able to achieve some of its objectives and goals. So some of the things that he has come up with were based on a series of surveys and, and very carefully designed studies. So here's a question for you. In a survey of pharmacists, they were asked, you know, which of these would you most likely pick? In a group of pharmacists, in this whole room, if I were to strap it to, to put you into categories, where would most of you fall? So you got that answer in your head? This is one case where I'm not asking you to share. Because when this was done in a controlled manner, with a random sampling of pharmacists, this is the one that they picked. Now, that you all were responding the same way I did, which was, well, I, you know what? And for the very first time in September, I was actually in the hospital for surgery in my entire life. Never broke a bone, nothing bad. It was to have my tonsils taken out of all things. And then, yeah, go ahead and laugh. Um, and I remember this study. I asked questions about everything that was being shoved into me. They also had a medical student that was really screwed with his head, so it was a lot of fun. <laughs> you know, I'm a, I, I'm a uh, inducer, CP450 inducer, if you take that into account, with my anesthesia, and he was like... <laughs> <laughs> and the resident standing next to him, who was obviously read on the chart that I'm a pharmacist, was like... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is the number one response. And when you probe into this, as Dr. Austin did, one of the things that they discovered is that our identity as pharmacists, for many of us, has not been fully integrated into our personalities, into who we are. And he's not sure why, because you would expect, well, heck, how many of you know physicians personally? Family members, friends, things like that. Are they never not doctors? You know, you sneeze and they're starting a diagnosis. <laughs> Even if you know better how to treat it than they do. The thing is that most pharmacists said the following. Well, I know there's a hospital pharmacist down there watching all those meds. I don't have to worry about those medications because if it were me, 
I would be making sure that every order was perfect. Now, does that not make more sense? I don't have to question the medications that I'm receiving or my family member is receiving because I know there's somebody like me that's not in the basement anymore. <laughs> just taking care to make sure that those medications are correct. But that goes against the grain for most other professions who identify the following. I am a pharmacist and I am going to make sure that it is correct. So it was a very surprising result. The more that they did this, with or without peers in the room, now we've all got peers amongst us, if they were doing it in a setting where there were other professionals, nurses, dentists, etc., podiatrists, um, we started asking in research, what is the typical profile of an average pharmacist, regardless of practice setting, years in practice, young, old, etc. And they essentially identified five big personality traits, especially as we begin looking at collaborative practice and interactions in a team care model. Openness, conscientiousness, energy, extroversion, excuse me, I call it energy, agreeableness, and neuroticism. <laughs> so where do you think we fell? Where do you think we fell as a group? And this was not only us that was doing this assessment, it was those outside of us, our colleagues, our healthcare professional colleagues. This is basically what we are, to their eyes. Always consistent, okay, very reliable. You ask them to do something, they do it. Uh, they, got to, they got their stuff together. They're organized. They're not extroverts. And you'll notice that the circle for between friendly and standoffish is right in the middle because it completely depends on the pharmacist that you have interacted with. And then lastly, we our feelings can hurt really, really easily. So there's something about what drew us to pharmacy or brought us into pharmacy that we collectively, every time he does the study, comes up with the same basic response. So here's our problem. As we start expanding out into the areas that we want to evolve the pharmacy profession into, we have to recognize that we're dealing with other professional cultures that are dissimilar to our own. Bottom line is, you can say all you want about the fact that when pharmacists are involved in clinical care and working in a collaborative manner in team medicine, we get better patient outcomes. Do you agree with that statement? Literature supports that statement. Pharmacoeconomics supports that statement. When we all work together, the patient has a better clinical outcome, and the healthcare system saves money. The problem is, the socialization process, which we talked about a little bit before, you still back there or did you leave me? Are you paying attention to me? Yes, you, <laughs> and you've been quiet, right? All right, the socialization process we talked about is different for different professionals. And unfortunately, what we are seeing is the socialization process for physicians and nurses are in direct conflict to the way that pharmacists were socialized. What wins power? Who's in charge? Who's calling the shots? So, quick question for those of you who know physicians. What is their model of learning? Anyone want to take a guess? King of the Mountain, love it. Sister, you're right. Also known as Big Dog or Alpha Dog. Here's what happens. Big Dog, fault leader, opinion leader, researcher, whatever it happens to be, CMO, says this, little students and residents and underling physicians, is the way we're going to do it. And what do they do? 
they follow. It's pack mentality. So you got a leader, you got a pack mentality. I want to make sure that I'm part of the team. I want to make sure that I'm seen as an obedient follower. That's the physician model. How about nurses? What is the nursing socialization process? Give of yourself. Right, exactly. The person in front of you, it's not just about their health care. It's not just about making sure that they're comfortable. It's about making sure that they feel safe and secure. That's their socialization model. What is our socialization model in pharmacy? And we all went through it over and over and over again. How are we truly socialized in pharmacy school? And in our first rotations, and probably every day since, thou shalt not make a mistake, ever. Ever. I can still remember the TA that took off two points for my perfect, absolutely, perfectly typed. We had typewriters then, didn't we? Guys, when you get back to your room, young ones, um, look those up on eBay or just go to the link for typewriter. And there were kinds that had plugs and kinds that didn't have plugs. Um, perfect. But I had a thumbprint that got on the cell phone when I wrapped the label. And I got two points off for that because it wasn't perfect. How many of you were expected to fill or are expected to fill any prescription in your pharmacy perfectly every single time? Show of hands. Okay, how many of you are allowed a 5% error rate? 3% error rate. Plus minus 1% uh, error rate. Anybody? Or perfect? It's perfect. Try being in a collaborative relationship with someone who is saying, I told you so, and we have all been taught to never trust anyone that gives us prescription information. Question for you. Every prescription that you get for a controlled substance, think a C2. Think OxyContin. What's the first thing that happens? What's your first reaction? It's like I walked down, you had an initial impression of me. What's your impression of that OxyContin prescription? Forgery, <laughs> addict, doctor shopper, pharmacy shopper, gonna sell them on the street. I made three bucks off of this script, he's gonna sell for 300. <laughs> it is inbred into us not to trust. Guess what? The script comes in and it's for, I don't know, the latest diabetic medication. What do you do? What do you do? I'll prefer a calling for a prior off. Um, what's the first thing you do? You know what an assessment? What is this drug? Do I know this drug? Before I do anything else, I gotta go look this up. What the hell is this? Where did it come from? Do we have it already? Or if not, I gotta call the Castle Cardinal A there commercial story and get it. You know, you're, you're looking up the page, the package insert, right? And then you're automatically doing an assessment. I see the patient in front of me, I've got this patient profile. We combine and process so much information, but we don't trust what's on that piece of paper. There is always a moment, no matter what it is, because we were trained that we are the last stop before the drug gets into the hands of the patient. And that's a fantastic, fantastic thing for us to take on as a social responsibility, but it makes us very hard to work with. <laughs> We are impossible to work with because we demand perfection from others the same way that we expect and demand perfection for ourselves. However, 
Other people don't expect to be perfect. Nurses don't expect it to be perfect. They just want their patient to feel better and be comfortable. Doctors don't expect the diagnosis to be perfect every time. What is their philosophy? Well, if that drug didn't work, we'll try another one. Uh, doc, you know, you have now, like, given them multiple side effects. We've got an antigen thing here. Why don't you take this drug off? Oh, no, just increase the dose, and we'll be fine. So they experiment and they play because someone has told them that it is okay to do that. For us, we were never told it was okay to be a little bit fast, a little bit loose. We know also that greater than 65% of pharmacists will self-identify as conflict avoiders. This kind of goes with the passive aggressive thing. We know that about 65% of community practitioners, family physicians, are forcers. Just do what I tell you to do. And if you think about it and really look inside yourself, you'll probably say, you know what? I am an avoider when it comes to conflict. So these are all the things that when we look at the literature and actually do some studies about us, and analyze what is it related to the psyche of pharmacists and the perception of ourselves and people's perception of us, which we're coming to next, that keep us from achieving what we want. So some of the things that, that uh, Zubin has talked about, and he really does give the most fascinating presentations. You, you want to like um, go back to pharmacy school and start all over again. Um, is how important it is that we identify and positively reinforce positive behaviors. Sounds really basic, but we haven't really done that. So, there was someone in the leadership breakfast this morning, and I saw her a moment ago, that is doing MTM billing. Yes, there you are. Stand up. Okay. You're one of the first ones to register to be able to bill CMS for medication therapy management. So, right. How many of you are billing for MTM services? Stand up. Stand up. It's okay. Great. The rest of you, applaud them, please. Okay. People like Amy and Roberta and Scott and Steve over there. Debbie. Okay, my eyes are not that good. Carol and Patricia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of you are doing what we have been saying we want to do. How many of you are going up saying, Amy, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. You're the leader. You're taking us to the next step. Or do you sometimes feel like you're doing it all by yourself? Like blazing, trail. blazing a trail, yes. And you know what happens to the trailblazers? The rest of us are behind you shooting our arrows at you. <laughs> okay. So, Reinforcing positive behavior, that's a celebration for our profession once we identify where we're going. But we don't do that very well. Let's make this a little bit even worse. And then we're going to end on a positive note, I promise. And Mary, I show us we've got 15 minutes, so we're rocking and rolling here. Perceptions of pharmacists from others. As I said, I spent a lot of time up on Capitol here. So in the past, Three weeks as I was prepping for this meeting, as I'm sitting down with the staffer, I said, okay, here's what I need you to do. Forget what we were just talking about. It's not going to offend me whatsoever, but what do you think of us in pharmacy? It's not the compounding stuff. I just, pharmacy. Because they're constantly having lobbyists, professional association groups, organizations from every industry coming in to talk to them. What's your impression of us? as pharmacists, and this is some of the stuff that I got to see. And this is painful. My personal one that, that gets me more than anything else is number two. Why can't you guys get your act together? How many pharmacists are there in the United States? Steve says 300,000. How many are actually in practice, Steve? Because that's, that's correct. If you look at licenses, 300. 
about 225,000 licensees in practice in pharmacy in the United States. How many organizations do we have? Okay, I got APHA, I got the National Community Pharmacists Association, I got the Academy of Managed Care Pharmacy, I got the National Home Infusion Association, I've got the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, I've got the International Academy of Compounding Pharmacists, I've got uh, National Association of Chain Drug Stores, thank you very much. The Healthcare Distribution Management Association, HDMA, which used to be the National Wholesale Drugs Association. Um, ooh, guys, I didn't mention ASHP because all I did was just recite the people that are in Alexandria, Virginia, and the southern half of Washington, D.C. Let's go up to the north side of town. ASHP, American Society of Health System Pharmacists. Do they have subsidiaries also? Yes. I can barely keep up with them, and that's my job. And meanwhile, this 27-year-old staffer in a major congressman's office is saying, why can't you keep up with them? Because we have created, unfortunately, a self-induced wall. It is not only between us and our patients, but it is between us and each other. So let's do a little test on this. I need to show of hands. You know what? Maybe it's stretch time. Feel free. So if you're a community practice, let me see you. All right, look around. See the people in the community. Great. Okay. Institutional practice. Okay, about the same. Other. Academicians, people who have wandered in off the streets. <laughs> me and Larry Wagonette, who, by the way, if you ever see me or Larry standing behind a counter, please take yourself, your family, and your pets across the street to some other pharmacy. <laughs> and in the event that we are still there six months later and are not in jail, you may bring a prescription back. So there's, uh, there's others of us in the room. Tax, where's our support help? Fantastic. Student pharmacy. Any pharmacists? All right, we've got a good break between half institutional, half community. That's fantastic. And by the way, MPA needs to congratulate itself as being an umbrella organization that has brought everyone together to be able to have dialogue. But, but now I'm going to put you on the spot to see how well you're doing, and you're at the top of the heap. So, for the health system pharmacists, institutional ones, federally and or state, what are the top three issues for the community pharmacists? Do you know? So, institutional pharmacists, raise your hands again. Come on. Oh, now you go. I know where he's going with this one. Put your hands up. Come on. Health system, long term care, hospice. Home infusion, etc. All right. I can't pick somebody that's on the board. That's not fair. This nice lady here in the red. Stand up. What's your name? Carrie. 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 So, what are the what uh, the top priorities for the community pharmacists? Third party reimbursement. Don't go, sure, come on, Carrie. It's all right, this is good. Third party reimbursement, they're always whining about getting paid. Yeah. Staffing, because they, they're too expensive, or can't get COVID. Staff, I don't know, staffing, Dave, shut up, just let me get this out. Okay. One more, pick one. Patient Ed, okay. Thank you. So, how many of you, health system pharmacists, agree with uh, Carrie's identifications? Kind of? Yeah, maybe. Are there other ones? I don't know. How many don't know? You're not really sure. Well, third parties, because they're always whining about third parties, for God's sake. <laughs> right? But, you know, other than that, what are the other top issues for community pharmacists? So, Payment for 
Department of Care Services is their number one priority. By the way, this is an amalgam between NCPA and APHA and NACDS and Walgreens and Rite Aid and Walmart. The number one issue is being re reimbursed for pharmacist care services unrelated to the drug product. That is their long-term legislative and advocacy objective. Number two is access, quality of the drug supply. Excuse me, this is actually off. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Here we go. This is what I just need to shut up on my slide. Payment for MTM services. Number one. What's in my head? Patient care, pharmacist care. Reimbursement issues, being in your correct on this one, Carrie. Being able to get into the network, getting paid fairly, being treated fairly for audits, adequate payment. And number three is issues related to my ability to obtain medications. Because I'm starting to get squeezed out of the marketplace by pharmacies that are only permitted to participate in a network to dispense certain medications or drug companies that make a decision. I'm bypassing pharmacy entirely and I'm going straight to physicians. By the way, if you are not paying attention to this one, you need to be concerned, because I am. Pfizer is now in an alignment with a pharmacy to do direct dispensing of Viagra to patients. And that's been going on, correct, right, for a while. Did you know that? A drug company and a pharmacy sending out prescriptions. How much longer before the pharmaceutical manufacturer owns a pharmacy? Is that coming and do we need to prep for it? So access is their other one. So let's go to the health system pharmacist. For all of you who raised your hand, how many of you have called or written or done anything to support these issues on behalf of the community pharmacist? Some of you have, most of you, no, it's their issue. So let's do it the other way. Community pharmacists, raise your hands back up. Uh oh, y'all, y'all suddenly disappeared on me. <laughs> now you're tired, so, because you know what's going to happen. You're going to get nailed like poor Carrie did. Community pharmacists, raise your hand again. Chain, independent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Don't be embarrassed. So the question is, what are the top three for the health system pharmacists? Want to take it? No. No? None? Not a clue. <laughs> she works at the VA and she's sheltered. <laughs> so, okay. They just take you in and lock you down and they say, you know, just do it the VA way. All right, here we go. Great, somebody adopt Carrie too, because I'm afraid she's locked in this little closet of hell. So, what are the health system, the institutional pharmacist priorities? Gosh, payment for pharmacist care services, the recognition of the management of drug therapy that they do in house, and also through ambulatory care services associated with the health system. Quality and safety of the drug supply. They're worried about drug shortages and dealing with compounding, and where am I going to get normal saline bags? And as someone mentioned this morning, Hospira, a major supplier of drugs who has a recall every other day. I'm worried about the quality of what I have in my institution. Number three is workforce issues, hiring and finding good people. And for every community pharmacist in this room, if you don't tell me that that's not also an issue that you deal with on a regular basis, you're lying to me. All of us do as employers, finding and retaining good people. Do these look kind of similar? So community pharmacists, what have you done to help the health system pharmacists? Call, written, or is that their problem? You know, there's an MSHP, we, they'll take care of it. There's MCPA, they'll take care of our stuff, or MASCP. What are the top three legislative priorities for the Michigan Pharmacists Association? I don't care where you practice, students, technicians, everybody. My question to you is this. What are the top three priorities for your association? You're here at their meeting. So, if you know, raise your hand. Oh, crap. 
because I'm seeing one hand raised. Okay, I'm seeing one hand raised. I'm seeing a couple little waves, and then they disappear because they know what's going to happen. <laughs> and the one hand that's being raised is by Dr. Wagonek in the back of the room, and he gets paid to know this stuff. So I pulled some of the stuff off of the website. And by the way, there's a lot more than three. But y'all have been talking about one of them. Dr. Jim talked about it. There's a little thing in the back of the room related to reimbursement. <coughs> But it's payment for pharmacist care services. Guys, it's all the same. We want to get paid for what we know. It doesn't matter if I'm in a health system or in a long-term care facility doing a DRR. It doesn't matter if I'm a nuclear pharmacist and I'm doing a half-life calculation. It doesn't matter if I'm a home infusion pharmacist. It's all the same. There's this stuff, and then there's the stuff up here. And that's what we want to get paid for. That's our long-term objective. Right, Larry? Larry's nodding his head. Yes, that's what we're doing. Dr. Steve from APHA, is that our objective? Yes. Get paid for what we know and do. So my question to you is, what have you done to change somebody's perspective or perception on Capitol Hill? It took you five minutes or less 500 of you in this room to figure out a picture of a dog. <laughs> Seriously, think about it. Five minutes to change your perspective on a picture of a dog. What if you had taken the five minutes out of your day to call, advocate, write, send a fax, send an email, someone in a position that can get us paid for what's in our head? or can help us with reimbursement issues, or the health system pharmacists who are worried about drug shortages. Could you afford five minutes? Three what? Three? Larry, guess what? I have two more slides. You happy now? You happy? Larry, you happy? Wow. Wow. Okay. Do you have five minutes to do that? There's a sign-up sheet in the back. Hank, you're probably sitting on it, dude. <laughs> There's a sign-up sheet in the back. So you could actually help deal with, we want to get paid for MTM. It's, yeah, it's partially community pharmacy, but it's Medicaid and Medicare, and that spills over into all of our businesses in some manner. Can you take the five minutes to do that? Yeah. Because you did it for a dog. It's not even a real dog. It's an ugly dog picture. And some of you over there still don't see the dog. <laughs> and you're laughing about that, but I guarantee you there's a lot of pharmacists that are not in this world. Who no matter how much you told them about how important it is to do this or be involved or come to this meeting, or donate or contribute or spend some time for APHA or ASHP or heck, even IACP, will never see that dog. We changed your perspective, and we did it together. Some of you got it instantly. Some of you are on the forefront of MTM services, the trailblazers, being beaten down and kicked. And they're the ones that are going to tell the person next to them, who's going to tell the person next to them, who finally, oh my god, you finally yeah. see it. Yeah. OK, <laughs> jeez. Chris.
next to you. Turn off the machines. Turn off your clickers. Turn off your, yes, that one there that you're looking at. I saw it. The flash of the screen, I saw it. Turn it off. Talk to the person next to you. Better yet, go talk to somebody you have never met. Find a health system pharmacist if you're an independent owner and say, what's driving you crazy? Because you will discover that you have a lot in common. You have a lot in common. My gosh, these students come now, none of them know anything about business. Tell me about it. They don't even know how to mix an IV. We have a lot more in common than we do apart. Give to the pack, Hank. There, there you go. Because it's not just what we say, it's also, unfortunately, and I live it every day, you gotta pay to play. It really is true. It doesn't have to be a lot, but just enough to say, I am not only personally engaged, I'm financially engaged, and I expect you to help us, Congressman, Senator, Assemblyman, State Senator, Councilman, with my issue, finding good pharmacists and pharmacy students, getting paid. You know what? And again, it only takes a few minutes to send a letter. For those of you who were in the Starbucks line yesterday afternoon, it was long. It took more time to get that latte than it would to send an email to a congressman saying, we want payment for pharmacist services and expansion of MTM. Because, this is a classic quote that we have all heard, every one of us is in this together. We are all pharmacists. They don't differentiate amongst us. The perception of people outside is that we're all the same. So why not act that way? Let's unite, let's identify something that we want and move forward. And finally, to circle back to what we started with, with the family circle cartoon and the little ghost that popped up here and there, is one that I really like. I actually had this one taped over a thumbtack, one of the bulletin board over my desk. Because I hear this all the time. We'll tackle that one tomorrow. We'll tackle that one tomorrow. I'll do it tomorrow. I'll make a phone call tomorrow. I'll sign that sheet in the back tomorrow. I'll give somebody pack money tomorrow. You know, I'll put it on my to-do list. It's never tomorrow. It is never tomorrow. It's only today. So with that, I ask you all to have a fantastic MPH. You know, I can put the H in. I was H. MPA convention here in Detroit. Spend time with your colleagues. My thanks to the staff, my thanks to Larry, and my thanks to all of you, and I hope you really enjoyed this morning.